Decadence is probably one of the most unique shows of this year for me, with the way its story's wild twists hit the ground running and sometimes stumble over the finish line. Admittedly, it's not a perfect show, but everything about its presentation and characters and world and the many technical and thematic ideas it explores just kept hitting all the right notes for me, and its occasional discordance, if anything, only added to that melody. And today, I want to talk about all these strange details and why I think they make Decadence a show to remember. And as always, I want to start with where these unusual bits and pieces were found in the first place. For anyone who may not know, Decadence is an original anime series directed by Yuzuru Tachikawa and produced by Studio Nut, set in a post-apocalyptic landscape ravaged by monstrous beasts called Gadol, where the remnants of humanity, now known as tankers, live inside the titular mobile fortress under the protection of the Power, a fighting force primarily made up of alien warriors known as Gears. The story itself follows Natsume, an ambitious young girl with a prosthetic arm fresh out of school with dreams of joining the battle against the Gadol, who instead gets stuck on cleaning duty with a grumpy old boss called Kaburagi. However, after learning of his history with the power, she eventually convinces him to train her in the hopes of being able to prove herself, all the while unaware of the dark secrets Kaburagi's hiding from her about the truth of this world. It's not a unique premise, initially at least, but its appeal lies less in the basic concept and more in the specific way it presents and explores it, with some absolutely stunning designs, set pieces and direction that makes it all pop. However, the road to that bombast was a lot longer than you'd initially expect. It all started with the relationship between the two leads of the project, Yuzuru Tachikawa and Takuya Sunoki, who first met in the mid-2000s after joining Studio Madhouse, and who worked together across various productions over their career. But it wouldn't be until 2013 that the extent of their creative compatibility became clear in their addition to that year's Young Animator Training Project, the same place where Studio Trigger's original Little Witch Academia OVA was aired, as Madhouse released their own short film, written, storyboarded and directed by Tachikawa, and produced by Sunoki, called Death Billiards. A tale about two men confronted with the reality of their demise through a pool table with a strong sense of style and storytelling that was eventually expanded into a full series better known as Death Parade. However, despite its success, Tsunoki felt that to make the kinds of truly wild projects he wanted to, he'd need to leave Madhouse, which he eventually did in 2017 to found Studio Nut, where he could make shows that were truly nuts, thus the name. Not because it had obviously fitting euphemism. The original idea for Decadence started to brew in 2016, but it'd be a while before either Tsunoki or Tachikawa would have a chance to act on it, as they both got busy with different projects, with Tachikawa getting wrapped up in directing Mob Psycho 100 in 2016, and Tsunoki's newly founded studio quickly getting to work on the saga of Tanya the Evil in early 2017. And as Tachikawa describes, even when they did get time to work on it, it took even longer than they expected to work out the kinks. It takes a long while to develop the setting and characters for an original work, so I prioritized developing the script for the dramatic beats that I wanted to depict. When a draft for the script spanning the final episode was done, we would flesh out the problem parts from the beginning, fleshing out the details of the setting as we went along. Because the story has some very unique qualities, it's been difficult reflecting that in the design side. Decadence's path to production was a long road indeed. The only thing that matches its production timescale is the physical scale the show leans into. While these kinds of over-the-top highs are nothing new, it's something that Tachikawa never had much chance to explore, but wanted to challenge himself with. And I think the show outdid itself. Whether it be in the hulking mass of Decadence's patchwork steel hull looming nearly 3,000 feet above the ground, the earth-shattering footsteps of the Gadals big enough to obliterate mountains, the sheer ridiculousness of Decadence's final attack and how it literally levels the landscape behind it to fucking punch a monster to death. <laughs> or even in the battles themselves as the arid wastes outside Decadence's protection get swarmed by monsters and fighters alike, fighting tooth and nail for their respective survival and whose stakes reach similarly tenuous heights, as the series has no qualms about leaning into the brutality such fights involve and the mourning that follows. Though, at least for the former details, it's not something I think always comes across well, as the lack of detail both in the behemoths themselves and in the landscape surrounding them makes it hard to get a proper sense of their size, which I think is only made worse by some floaty camera placement that makes them feel more like miniatures than proper giants. That said, there's still a grand weight to Decadence's world and its design that gives it an almost epic quality, in the ancient sense of the word, that simultaneously makes its characters feel so small in comparison to the gargantuan constructs around them, and yet makes every action they take feel so important and impactful. 
that intensity is only heightened by the artistry with which the series is rendered, particularly in its animation. Every fight is filled to bursting with sweeping camera shots, high octane action and an incredible sense of speed and momentum that takes advantage of the free floating nature of its combat to pull off some stunning work. The Gadol themselves, despite the awkward 3D look, are just as well animated. And as an interesting side note, I think their particular movements complement the characters' maneuvers quite nicely, as their brute force swings and charges starkly contrast the elegance of their human opponents. But it's not just in the action that the animation shines, as that same level of skill can easily be seen in the show's smaller moments, especially in the expressions and body language of the characters themselves, particularly Natsume, who honestly just got every best goddamn face you can imagine, and, well, everything Pipe does. I mean, just look at him. Takes a pet like no problem. That's a great beluga whale looking whatever the fuck he is right there. I just adore Decadence's animation. But if there is one place where I think it falls short on a technical level, it's in its characters. Not because they're badly written, in fact, I think the show's core appeal lies in how well crafted the main cast's respective personalities are, and the dramatic tension that underlines their relationships, but in the way so much of its supporting cast gets left behind. It's understandable since many of these characters are only meant to act as background tropes, like bullies, bickering couples, badass siblings, creeps, etc. But there are lots of little details that hint at so much more going on under the surface of their respective psyches that I think could have been developed into something far more substantial. Like how getting caught in a battle and watching one of your friends get slaughtered might affect the bravado of the concerningly assertive quote-unquote ladies man. Or the nod it gives to the deeper complexity of the popular bully than what was initially presented. Or even just a deeper dive into the experiences that makes one particular tanker so blunt to younger members of the power. I just think it's a bit disappointing that the show never really goes any deeper into these characters than the surface level impression of the respective archetypes it introduces them with. It's a small thing, admittedly, but it's something I think could have added a lot more weight to its narrative. And while I understand they probably had to get cut for the sake of getting everything into a 12 episode run, it doesn't change how disheartening it is to see them all get left by the wayside. But even with that in mind, I think Decadence's production is filled with all kinds of quirky details that add to its technical appeal. Though I feel like I'm forgetting something here. Hold on. Uh, Tachikawa and Sonoki's history, did that. Gushing over pipe, did that. Natsume being like a YouTuber, uh, maybe later. Um, oh right, the corporate cyborg dystopia! So, in episode 2, Decadence reveals that its world is actually a video game, but not a virtual one. You see, in the late 2400s, as the world's air became too polluted for humans to live in, the global corporations at the time mass-produced a range of cyborg bodies for people to survive in this new atmosphere. As cyborgs eventually started to replace humans, one of these companies, Solid Quake, saw an opportunity in the ensuing chaos, and so bought the rights to Earth and humanity and sectioned off a chunk of Eurasia with a dome and converted it into an entertainment facility where its cyborg citizens could use physical avatars to fight against giant monsters on the Earth's surface, and interact with the remaining members of the near-extinct human population, and implemented an all-governing AI to ensure no one, neither human nor cyborg, could break this system. So the ridiculous fortress, the horrifying monsters, the tankers getting caught in the crossfire are all real things and real people that really exist in the same reality as the cyborgs, but which have all been gamified by a giant corporation for the fuck of it. It is quite a pivot, and I understand why it might turn some people off. I mean, it's gotta be frustrating going in hoping for sci-fi attack on Titan and instead being given anime Truman show. Or anime Truman game, I guess would be more accurate. Though, I have seen some takes comparing it to other shows that I think miss the point of this twist. Like Kado The Right Answer, which, to oversimplify, came late in the series and undermined the thematic ideas the show had been building up to at that point. But Decadence's twist comes right at the start of the series, and had been heavily hinted at throughout the first episode. Its bait and switch is more comparable to School Live than anything else, which, though initially being presented as a cute girl do cute things in a high school setting kind of show, quickly reveals that it isn't that, and where the switch is not only the whole point of the story, but is also the premise its narrative is actually trying to explore. And while there's nothing wrong with just being less interested in the Switch than the bait, arguing that it ruins the show kinda misses the forest for the trees, in my opinion. And personally, I think the twist makes the show far more interesting, not only because of the intense subversion of expectations it creates, but also because of the resulting societal disparity it explores between its world's inhabitants. 
Given the corporate focus of the setting, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say the disconnect between tankers and cyborgs can be seen as a kind of class conflict between the working class and the rich in a society dominated by capitalism. Not only is everything literally run by a mega corporation, but the fact that cyborgs were made by global companies would to me indicate that the people who could obtain those bodies would have had to have been in a decent financial situation to do so, and so too would Solid Quick need to have some unbelievable amounts of wealth to literally buy Earth and humanity in the first place. Life in the cyborg world, for lack of a better term, is riddled with little money-making schemes. Whether it be the amount of microtransactions that can be found in its many systems, or the simple fact that its motto is have a profitable day. Which starkly contrasts the situation in the tanker world, where some people are barely able to afford milk. Despite the post-apocalyptic look, Decadence's world is, in reality, one big corporate dystopia, where those lower down the economic rungs are forced to suffer and struggle on a daily basis just to get by for others' entertainment, while those on top, on an individual and company-wide level, are almost drowning in resources, and yet are still desperate to get even more profits and retention-based revenue as they can through exploitative products and consumption. Huh, so that's why it's called Decadence. What does the name of the fortress have to do with any of that? Oh! This disparity is made even more clear by their visuals. I'd say it's almost comparable to the way Dora Hetero emphasized the nature of its metaphorical class struggle, in its case being defined by magical potential, with the magic users' world being a renaissance-inspired fantasy land, and the mortals' world being a post-apocalyptic cityscape crumbling into ruin. It uses the designs of their respective homes to emphasize its world's inequality, and Decadence uses the same approach, with the tanker world being a vast, dry, and barren wasteland whose only notable features are the looming steel fortress lumbering through its dunes and thundras, and the runes of ones shattered into submission long ago, while the cyborg world is this bright, vibrant dreamscape that looks more like a playground than a city. But Decadence takes it a step further by shifting the very aesthetic of the show to emphasize that disconnect. The tanker world has a more typical anime look to it, with semi-realistic designs and proportions, while the cyborg world makes its characters as cartoony as possible, reducing them down to the bare basics of shape language and color theory and creating a cast of colorful beings that look more at home in a Pixar movie than in an anime. Which kinda makes sense, since Tachikawa himself is a big fan of Pixar, and has admitted to taking heavy inspiration from them for this series. Which certainly explains quite a few design choices. Tachikawa has also talked about the aesthetic disconnect of the show, saying that it was necessary so that the rulers of the world that commodifies those humans as products have their looks drastically different from the humans. The visual contrast between the tanker world and the cyborg world emphasizes their world's inequality. This can also be seen in their respective lifestyles. The tankers live every day on the edge, constantly fighting through a tough world full of horrifying monsters that take out entire swaths of their population with every encounter, and risk the lives of everyone inside their supposedly impenetrable fortress as a result. But the cyborgs yearn for the thrill of standing on that edge, knowing once it's done they'll pop back into their cushy living pods and can walk back out onto their streets that hand out fuel like candy, and where they can live for hundreds and maybe thousands of years with proper maintenance. Death is a distant worry for the cyborgs, and so they instead seek it out as a thrill, dying as many times as they're able to create a new account and are obsessed with it to the point of wanting to break the limiter that stops the experience from getting too real to get even closer to it. For the cyborgs, death is entertainment. They can do it as much as they like. For the tankers, death is reality. They only get one shot, and when it's gone, it's gone. This is only heightened by how the show cuts between the reactions of the tankers and cyborgs after some of the show's more devastating fights. Even the more lacking details of the show only add to this. I've seen some criticism of how little the show really tells us about cyborg society and what it's like beyond decadence. And while there are a lot of details that are revealed in interviews and articles on the official site, I think it is also quite questionable that anyone would have to go outside the show to find them in the first place. That said, not only do I feel those details aren't really necessary to follow the story, but I think the reason it shows so little of cyborg society beyond decadence is pretty clear. Because their society is decadence. 
They're obsessed with it. They identify themselves as players and users. Their social media posts are almost exclusively about the game and its players. They praise and idolize the best players like celebrities and icons. Cyborg society seems hollow and vapid because it is, as it's almost exclusively defined by its consumption of and participation in a product. Which, I know, seems like a weird concept, because I'm sure nothing like that has ever happened before in real life. Am I right? Gamers? That's almost as ridiculous as international companies creating technologies that become essential parts of daily life and increasingly define our sense of reality in increasingly invasive ways. Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! And this twist is something that, for the creators at least, is also what defines the show. As Tachikawa explains, it's not only a fun challenge to combine these wildly different aesthetics in a way that seems natural, but it also helps emphasize the core dynamic between Natsume and Kaburagi, with them both coming from completely different backgrounds with wildly different experiences with this world. One coming from a post-apocalyptic hellscape with dreams of saving the world, and the other from a sci-fi dystopia that's crushed what little hope for the future he had left. Hiromatsu Shu, one of the lead designers for the series has also commented on this latter detail, saying, The tankers have liveliness and are allowed, albeit limited, freedom and individuality. From the human perspective, their world has a post-apocalyptic atmosphere through which the decadence of the world is portrayed. In comparison, the world of the cyborgs who say things like the world must be rid of bugs is closer to the 1984 style of dystopia. For the cyborgs, the world of decadence is a world they escape from their reality to as a form of entertainment. That too is close to the dystopia of Brave New World. When the privileged class rules in perpetuity without even touching any other world, that, to me, is dystopia. Decadence's twist is a central pillar of its production. As jarring as it is, I think Decadence's twist provides the show not only with a more complex foundation upon which to build its narrative, but whose resulting thematic questions about the nature of class and corporate influence are far more fascinating to follow. And that last part is particularly poignant, considering the way the show connects its drama to the problems facing the real-world industries it's most directly tied to. There are a lot of details to decadence that I think, if indirectly, connect to the labor issues surrounding the industries the show is built around. The gaming industry and the anime industry. Since, you know, it's about a game, and is an anime. Granted, they're two very different businesses that face very different problems, but there are a surprising number of commonalities between them that I think the show highlights, as all three suffer from a structure that prioritizes its profits and products over people. The most obvious problem comes from their intense workloads. In Decadence, the tankers live in relatively poor conditions, stuck spending their days in slums and working tough, demanding jobs to maintain their mobile fortress, dangling thousands of feet in the air to clean its shell or risking heading outside into a monster-infested world to gather resources. And while the circumstances are very different, the gaming and anime industry are filled with similarly grueling conditions. It's not uncommon to hear about workdays in both reaching 10, 12, and sometimes even 14 hours, with work weeks that can stretch into and across the weekend, and in some cases, like the writing staff for Red Dead Redemption 2, clocking in 100-hour weeks. Or like the numerous employees from Madhouse who have to work nearly 400 hours in a single month with no days off. This overtime goes beyond working a few extra hours for a few days or weeks at the end of a project, since these crunch periods, as they're referred to, often last for months or even years on end. Part of this can be attributed to the detailed artistry of the mediums themselves, whether it be the luscious animations of well-renowned anime shows and movies, or in the hyper-realistically rendered textures of most AAA game productions. However, the bigger issue lies in the tight schedule these industries put their staff under, dropping huge piles of work onto animators and developers alike and expecting them to get it done in unreasonably short periods of time. Or from higher-ups shifting gears last minute and forcing everyone under them to make things work without any additional time to do so. And it's only gotten worse over time. The amount of anime being released every year has skyrocketed from a few dozen to over a hundred. And the video game industry has put an increasing emphasis on bigger and bigger scale productions in hopes of rewards that will be equally as huge, but which require far more resources and development time to achieve. 
and it only gets worse as the finish line for it stretches into the horizon. As the need to maintain a seasonal schedule makes the anime industry's work issues cyclical, game delays that one would expect to help prevent this kind of crunch from happening only end up extending it, and both their increasing reliance on the internet creates a situation where staff have to keep working even after the project is meant to be done. As anime staff have to go out of their way to correct lacking animations for DVD and Blu-ray releases, and game developers have to set up day one patches and regular updates, DLCs and microtransactions, and even full expansions long after launch. This last point is such an issue for gaming that there's a specific term used to describe the kind of crunch that seemingly has no end. Death March. And the feeling it creates is something I think is easily captured by decadence at the end of episode 5. After spending so long fighting and dying to one day see a world free of Gadol, where humanity can finally live outside without fear, and only maybe a few afters after they think they've achieved just that, the game's barrier comes down and before them sprawls a whole new region full of monsters. The players rejoice at the reveal of this brand new playground while the tankers stare on in confusion and dread as the reality that they're their fight isn't done dawns on them, that it won't be for a long time, and may never be. Staff in both the gaming and anime industry deal with intense conditions that push them to their limits because of scheduling and management that doesn't properly take the immensity of that work into account. This is all before you take into consideration the detrimental effects these conditions have on their health and well-being. In decadence, tankers are always in danger in one way or another, either by directly facing off against the Gadol or just from living in this world generally. As even for those living inside the fortress, there are still plenty of behemoths that can shake things up, break through their defenses, and even wipe out their home in an instant. Similarly, the intense hours and work that anime and gaming staff have to deal with can be just as disastrous for them both mentally and physically. The constant stress chipping away at their mental health and leading to them developing anxiety and depression, some developing ulcers that make them cough up blood, others in both industries ending up in hospital due to exhaustion, and in some tragic situations dying from strokes, heart attacks, or even suicide. One notable example in the anime industry in 2014 found that a Studio A1 employee, who'd passed away from the last of those examples, had racked up nearly 600 work hours in the month before their death. For context, that, at minimum, would mean working nearly 20 hour days for over a month. It emphasizes how badly these conditions can affect a person and the long term consequences that follow. And what makes it even worse is that in both cases a lot of those staff aren't properly compensated for that work. In the gaming industry, it depends on which country it's in, but in the US, where a big chunk of game development takes place, overtime doesn't have to be paid to salaried staff which most developers are. But in Japan, freelancers don't have to be paid overtime, which most animators are. This lack of compensation is especially harsh for doga, or in-between, animators, who are often only paid a few euro for each frame they draw, and since even the most efficient in-betweeners might only be able to get a dozen or so frames drawn a day, it means they only, at most, make about half of Japan's minimum wage. And the sad thing is, it's something that works for these industries. It's just cheaper to not pay because it lets them meet deadlines faster and on a tighter budget. And I think that desire to increase potential profit lines by any means can be seen by the state of these industries as a whole. The anime industry has had increasingly record profits over the last 20 years, but the average budget given to anime studios has remained stagnant, to a point where in 2015 about one quarter of all studios were near bankruptcy. And places like Blizzard, despite boasting about record profits in 2018, still laid off almost 800 staff in early 2019. The staff of both these industries are underpaid for their overtime because it simply saves money for the companies and publishers overseeing them. And it may make you wonder, if things are really this bad, why don't they just quit? They're clearly not cared for, so why bother? Well, the thing is, they do. Very often, in fact. In both industries, there's a high attrition rate, as most people who join end up leaving after only a few years. But they're very quickly replaced by a fresh batch of young people just as eager to get in. As explained by, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, Marie-José Legault, a Canadian researcher who, alongside a team of other experts, is looking into the working experiences in the game industry, there is a survey question in the DSS IGDA survey 2014 that asks respondents to agree or disagree with the statement crunch is a necessary part of game development. If we look at the responses to that question for people who identified as students and people who did not, we see quite a striking difference. The majority of non-students disagreed or strongly disagreed to the statement that crunch is necessary. Among student respondents, 26% agreed or 
or strongly agreed that crunch is necessary. Only 38% disagreed or strongly disagreed, and over a third could neither agree nor disagree. There is a higher level of initial acceptance to the notion of crunch. Arguably, this is what the industry relies upon. The ability to continually take on young and willing new entrants, and to replace those who burn out or otherwise leave for something else. It is fair to say that students and young new entrants to the industry do see crunch and unpaid overtime as a price of admission, as the way it is in games. This mentality only seems to be bolstered by the way many treat working in these industries as a privilege. That it's not real work, and that one should be grateful they're here instead of stacking shelves or crunching numbers at a normal desk job. A lot may not even want to speak out because of how desperate they are to make it a career. No one works in these industries unless they love what they do, and for a lot of people the more intense work, as difficult as it is, is also some of the most creatively fulfilling art they've made. And I think this can be seen bleeding into decadence, particularly in the emphasis it puts on the amount of young people who join the power, who end up dying soon after. <laughs> These industries use those most passionate about their respective mediums for everything they're worth, before burning them out and moving on to the next batch of youngsters who don't know any better to repeat the process and those running things don't really seem to care. In decadence, the system is more than happy to kill off boatloads of tankers to fulfill its needs, either to set up a storyline to reintroduce old legends, or by culling off their population for the sake of giving players a new experience. Hell, when things go wrong at the end of the series, its first reaction is to literally just wipe it all out and start over. <laughs> That same apathy runs rampant across the gaming and anime industries. One developer working on Fortnite following its explosive success talks about how, if it got to the end of an 8 hour workday and I turned to my supervisors to ask if I needed to stay on, they'd often look at me as if I was actively stupid. Officially you don't have to keep working, but in reality sit back down, we'll be here for a while. If you did not do overtime, that was a mark against your character. Another describes how, one senior guy would say just get more bodies. That's what the contractors were called, bodies. And then when they're done with them we can just dispose of them. They can be replaced with fresh people who don't have the toxic nature of being disgruntled. Some former developers from other studios have also described their experience with managers as though they'd gotten addicted to crunch. If they're able to get their team to go above and beyond to finish an important project on time or early, it can make the team and manager look better. That success leads to more responsibility, more projects, and more political capital, which can require more crunch time to complete. I've had to fight pretty hard with managers and directors to reject work so that co-workers and I don't burn out. And in the anime industry, it can very often be the case that those running the production, the companies on the production committee who fund and handle various aspects of the project, simply don't realize how dire the circumstances are for the studio they've hired, because studios often aren't on those committees. The higher-ups within these industries do little to make things better and don't seem very interested in trying. This apathy can even turn into outright disrespect. In the series, many cyborgs and players at best see tankers as a fun sideshow, and at worst as pests. They treat tankers as second-class citizens, which, given the state of its world, is a nice way of putting it. This same level of distaste for those lower on the social rungs can also be seen in the gaming and anime industry in the treatment of QA testers and production assistants, respectively. QA, or quality assurance, are staff who ensure that a game is actually playable, doing everything they can to find as many ways to break it to find bugs and glitches for developers to fix as they can. Production assistants are staff who ensure that all the necessary materials to complete an anime are not only done on time, but also brought to the right people and places to do so. And both positions are continually mistreated in their respective fields. QA testers are treated as lesser staff, with lower pay, fewer benefits, limited time off, and often not even being allowed to communicate with the development team directly. One article describes the experiences of contract QA testers working at Treyarch during the development of Black Ops 4 as follows. Testers work on the second floor of the office, while most of the other developers are on the first. Some testers say they're told not to speak to developers in other departments, and one told me they'll only do so surreptitiously, out of fear of getting fired. When they get to work, testers have to park their cars in a different parking lot than other employees, one that's further away from the office. When lunch is catered, testers are told that the food downstairs is for the development team, not for them. Sometimes they're allowed to scrounge for leftovers an hour later once the non-testing staff have gotten to eat. The situation is just as dire for production assistants. 
there's a constant pressure for them to always be present and available, even on days off, in case a production goes wrong, which they often do, and the enormous amount of travel costs that come with the job are only partially covered. Worse still, their working environments are often actively hostile toward them, as harassment, threats and outright violence are concerningly commonplace. Of 25 production assistants interviewed and surveyed by Sakuga Blog, 19 of them say they experienced psychological and or physical abuse in the workplace. One PA explains, We were told to choose between between getting punched or kicked, and there were actually people who sustained injuries from being hit or strangled. Resentment is able to build for those seen as lower down the production ladder and can make their already harsh working conditions actively hostile. And I could honestly keep going for hours with this, with the way crunch culture can create social pressure to uphold it, companies seemingly being misleading about their hours and conditions to avoid scandal, the allegations of sexual and sexist harassment and misconduct across both industries, the ironic way these crunch conditions can make these games and shows worse because of how easy it becomes for overworked employees to make and miss mistakes, and so goddamn much more. But this video is already long enough as it is, and I think the point's becoming painfully clear. The working conditions in the gaming industry and the anime industry are an absolute nightmare that, from all I've seen and read, comes from a simple issue that they're so obsessed with having a product to make a profit off of that they don't care how it gets made. If people are collapsing at their desk, if they're being harassed and abused, if they're barely able to stay afloat financially, so long as something gets made. And it's something that, in many ways, I think is reflected in decadence. Am I reading a bit too much into it? Maybe. Is this section a thinly veiled attempt to bring awareness to and encourage people to take action for workers' rights by highlighting issues in the industries they're most engaged with and thus most likely to give a shit about? Yes, obviously, but that's beside the point. It's a deeply cruel and unfair system that puts people through unnecessarily harsh conditions for no good reason. I mean, for fuck's sake, I've had friends and family who've worked in those industries who've had to deal with so much of this exact bullshit. And I feel that heartbreaking frustration with the way things are bleeding through every part of decadence, as it tries so desperately to hammer home the simple fact that the media we love, whether it be the games we bonded with friends over or the anime that sparked our passions, are built on the backs of people being broken for the sake of our entertainment. And how the ignorance of that, whether unintentional or willful, comes with a very real and very human cost. And it's with this in mind that the show's central narrative question becomes that much harder to answer. The main thematic throughline that defines Decadence's story for me is the way its characters try to achieve their goals in this highly restrictive system. It's something I think is embodied by Natsume, whose can-do attitude and relentless determination in the face of overwhelming odds is the kind of thing that's almost standard for an anime protagonist, but it also constantly leads to dead ends, not least of which is because of her disability. Her prosthetic arm continually makes people doubt her, as she's often treated like a burden and an outcast who isn't as capable as everyone else. It's a large part of what drives her throughout the series, to not only prove everyone wrong, but to help her develop some sense of confidence in herself. Of course, that's not to say her lack of a second hand isn't going to cause issues, as shown by the way it interferes with her training, but that doesn't mean it can't be worked around, as Kaburagi is quickly able to, with some spare parts and some technical know-how, transform her prosthetic arm into something much more effective. <laughs> With a small amount of consideration and accommodation, Natsume is easily able to perform on par with, if not better than, other fighters. It's something even the director himself has commented on, as he's explained the emphasis on bugs throughout the series as such. Bugs are simply defined by rules someone else made. They're considered problematic from someone else's viewpoint. On a basic level, Natsume's character arc emphasizes how, despite what the world may think, her disability isn't a hindrance. It's the expectations others have of it and the way they treat her as a result that stand in her way. 
and it's something that with the right help she's easily able to work with in her own way to achieve her dreams. But as inspiring as it is, it still takes a depressing turn as the series goes on. The structure of her world is very hard to break out of, not only forcing tankers to deal with this artificial system that constantly puts them in danger, but also in how so few tankers are able to get into the power in the first place, with them being overwhelmingly outnumbered by gears. Not out of chance, but because of the simple fact that they're literally not meant to be a part of it. The power was built for players in the cyborg world, not the technical NPCs in the tanker world. The regimented nature of this life can be seen right at the start of the series, with how these kids just leaving school have the jobs they'll probably be stuck with for the rest of their lives assigned to them when most aren't even proper adults yet. Hell, the reason Natsume ended up losing her arm in the first place was because of the system sending a doll to attack her dad whilst on an expedition for getting too close to the truth of this world. The highly restrictive nature of this system is even emphasized by the way Natsume is so often visually framed throughout the series, as being stuck behind bars or surrounded on all sides, over and over and over and over again, even after she finally manages to join the power, when she simply swapped out one type of restriction for another, and sees how her efforts seemingly amount to nothing. It's even something that's paralleled later in the show when Kaburagi's attempts to work hard to get out of the correctional facility he's thrown into for disobeying the system and letting a bug live is revealed to be pointless. Natsume is able to overcome the odds, but only by defining her worth on how useful she can be to the society that had for so long gone out of its way to put her down. At the end of the day, the way in which Natsume achieves her dream still plays into what the system wants, and it takes a toll on her. <laughs> The reality of the system is something that Kaburagi is already aware of. He practically already lived the dream, rising to the top of the ranked players list and being one of the most well-regarded users in decadence, but whose career quickly fell apart because of one young kid's decision to break the rules to achieve his dream, something the system wasn't happy with. He fell from grace and got stuck working for the system in this rusted reality, the only real choice he gets to make being when to let himself die by refusing to maintain his cyborg body. It's the kind of apathetic and depressed outlook that I'm sure a lot of people who've grown up being told that they can do anything as long as they work hard enough can relate to, as the reality of how the world works becomes painfully clear. As it goes on, Decadence's answer to the question of whether to chase your dreams is a grim one, because whatever way in which you do so in such a system is inherently flawed, because of how quickly the structure of said world turns it into a nightmare. But that doesn't mean something can't be done about it. Kaburagi's experience seeing everything Natsume goes through not only inspires him to start trying again, but also opens his eyes to how cruel and unfair the system truly is, and drives him on a path to utilize the power of collective action to break it and build something new, speeding toward an ending that… happens. I mean, it is a nice ending, but it does feel quite lackluster, while with the Matrix-ass final boss that just kinda… gives up the not-so-subtle Gurn Lagan reference, and how everyone just sorta lives happily ever after with no real mention or reference to how the tankers react to the sudden influx of cartoony cyborg people? There's a lot that feels like it just got glossed over. But I get it. Sure, it could have been handled better, but I think it gets the point across well enough. That the suffering and cruelty of the way things are don't have to be the way they always will be. There are alternatives, or at the very least the most destructive and exploitative aspects of these systems don't need to be repeated over and over again. Whether you're talking about the show's hypothetically specific circumstances or in its real world parallels. Janky as it may be, it's an ending that emphasizes the fact that things can get better. These systems were made by people and can just as easily be rebuilt by them too. Something the show practically screams at the audience. 
It may be difficult, but it can be changed into something that, at the very least, is fairer for everyone. I don't think Decadence is perfect, but it did strike a nerve for me. I can see the earnest effort bleeding through every part of its production and how do people behind it get across their concerns and worries and dreams for the industries they've dedicated themselves to and the people they work with, and whatever nitpicks I have just fall to the wayside. And it's a feeling I think in this digital day and age where everyone seems to be rushing to find that 10 out of 10 narrative with flawless characters in a pristine setting often gets forgotten. It's a weird experience, but it's what I value most in the art and media I enjoy. That even through their faults, they're able to resonate. And for me, that's exactly what Decadence does. And yeah, those are my thoughts. Man, three World of videos in a row. Don't worry, I regret making them just as much as you regret watching them. Uh, I'm joking, but three 30 minute plus videos in a row was... Maybe not a good idea, especially this one, because Jesus fucking Christ, the notes document alone was nearly a hundred fucking pages. It's a good thing Christmas is around the corner, because I feel like I'd need a break after this. And as a side note, for anyone who, after watching this, is concerned about the state of these industries and may want to see what they can do to help, I'd say, firstly, support unions. It's a whole lot harder for companies to ignore workplace complaints when it's a company-wide strike instead of just a few employees. And secondly, I will leave some links to organizations in the description trying to do just that, like Game Workers Unite and the Animator Dormitory Project, and etc. Some are more band-aid solutions than full-blown fixes, but they are a lot better than nothing. Anyway, hope you are staying safe, keeping your distance, washing your hands, wearing a mask, let me know what you think, if you agree, disagree, how you feel about Decadence's twist, what other original anime you're obsessed with, etc. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I talk about Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, and why its tragic qualities make it so captivating. Or watch me ramble about Doro Hetero, and its unapologetically in-your-face chaotic energy. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe! To come flag me. Hit the bell, stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts at humor. Follow me on Instagram for semi-regular art stuff. And hopefully, I'll see you later.